verse number four and following, Ahab tried to impress Jehoshaphat with a religious presentation. You remember that? Do I need to read it? You know, their, their false prophets uh, acted like he was a bull, you know, and he put the horns on. He said, you'll plow them up. You'll plow them under. And, and Jehoshaphat was sitting there watching all this, and I could, I could see Jehoshaphat. In my own mind, as I was reading this, I could see Jehoshaphat's reaction. He'd say, G give me a preacher. G -g give me a preacher. Y you, you can tell, you can almost tell theatrics, can't you? Well, you can tell it. There's no, no doubt about it. You can tell theatrics. And uh, so, so give me a man of God. See, when you know what truth is, Mike Ballard, you'll always know what truth is not. When you know what truth is, it's an automatic red flag when you hear anything different. When you know it, you know it in the very depths of your soul. Well, I believe that Jehoshaphat was like that. He knows what truth is, so he wanted another man. And so in comes another Elijah and John the Baptist, except this fellow's name was Micaiah. Micaiah. And he did the same. He told him the truth. Rather, rather tell you the truth and you get mad at me than to lie to you and pat you on the back and, and, and act like a bull with horns walking around saying you're going to plow them under. You know, you're going to beat them all. You'll push them back. Micaiah said, no, you're going to die. You're not going to win and you're going to die. I told you he didn't like me, Ahab told Jehoshaphat. And nevertheless, what did Jehoshaphat do? He went on up with him. He went on up with him. So there was that military alliance. In 2 Chronicles chapter number 18 and verse 28 and 29, even some more colors of Ahab comes out. And I hate to say it, but I think some colors of Jehoshaphat comes out as well. Jehoshaphat evidently is a man easy scam. Look, look, at, look at chapter number 18, verse number 28 and 29. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and will go to the battle, but put thou on thy robe. So the king of Israel disguised himself and they went to the battle. Now hold on a minute now. Where is a major fighting going to be done? Around the king, around the general. They want the general. They want the king. So I believe Jehoshaphat swallowed that hook, line, and sinker. He did. Uh, but now it was per adventure that that, that era got uh, Ahab, wasn't it? Was that, was, that a, was that just a coincidence? No, it wasn't. Micaiah prophesied that it was going to happen. <laughs> Matt, sir? <laughs> it was a phoenix missile. Amen. So, uh, so anyway, I'm not going to read all that. I know it's going to take time to read it all that, but uh, people have been doing that for years. They've been scamming for years. It, just just stay, hang around our office for a little while during the daytime, and you'll, we'll, you'll probably get four or five phone calls of people wanting your social security number or they're wanting you to buy some swamp land and... and uh, in the Sahara Desert or something. I don't know. You know, they'll, they'll want you to do something. They'll try to scam you and do everything they can. Once your credit card numbers, they'll call and tell you they're the IRS. And you know the IRS does not call people. They send out letters. They send out letters. They, they'll call you and tell you that you're in trouble and you owe. They'll call and tell you your people are in jail. Your, 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 your military people's sons and daughters are in jail and you need to bail them out or we're going to uh, keep them here forever. And, and poor old, poor old grandma and grandpa, you know, they'll give everything they have. Um, anyway, what's funny is to watch a program where the, the scammers get scammed. You're, <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah, Johnny. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. What's, you know, just tell them, I'd rather meet you in person. I don't like talking on the phone. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, but here's, here's poor old Jehoshaphat. He's got his robes on. He's in the heat of the battle. Now, there's, there's a lesson right here. There's a lesson. When, when God's man joins hands with the ungodly, he himself is mistaken for the worldling. 
when God's man joins hands with the ungodly. Now, you wonder why, some of you wonder why you're going through difficult decisions, difficult times. Maybe it's a crowd you're hanging with. Maybe it's a crowd you're hanging with. Well, I'm, I, I don't believe, brother, you know, Brother Donnell, I don't believe people just talk to me like that. I don't believe they ever talk to me like that. Why do they talk to me like that and don't talk to you like that? Who are you hanging with? Are you smelling and looking like the world? Then don't be surprised if the world attacks you. You join hands with the ungodly, you're going to be, you're going to be worldly. The world will get in you, amen? You're mistaken for the worldly. And, a, and uh, Joseph was mistaken for the king of Israel and uh, not Ahab. So anyway, the Lord brought him out of it. In chapter 19, Chapter 19. Go, I told you it's going to be quick about this story. In chapter number 19, Jehoshaphat is glad to escape. I'm glad it's over. I'm glad it's over. Why in the world did I do something stupid like that? Why, why, did, I, why, why did I ever join hands with the ungodly? Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. They have the king of Israel is dead. But thank God Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, the southern kingdom, is still alive, and he's well. Now, he's well, but um, the wrong decisions that he made still haunted him. Returning home to Judah, his proud strength uh, was gone. His proud strength was humbled. His policy was disgraced. You know, every president loves to have a policy that'll stand. And... Uh, it, his policy was disgraced. He, he was met by another faithful man of God with a very searching question. And this prophet's question in chapter number 19 and verse number 2 by Jehu was this right here. Shouldst thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Should you love the ungodly and hate them which love the Lord? I wonder why you take the sides you take. I wonder why you keep the company you keep. Now, the Bible talks about loving people. We love people. We, we love people. You know, if, 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 people, if Jesus Christ didn't love sinners, I never would have got saved. I never would have been saved. So don't think just for a second because I'm a pastor or a preacher that... Uh, uh, in, in my earlier days, I didn't, I didn't hold hands with the devil. I don't, I, that's all I'm going to say about that. I wasn't a saved man. I was a lost man. I was a lost man. I, I, I was in the military. I was in the Navy. And uh, I, I, I did what lost men do. So, I, I, and I'm ashamed of it. But thank God I'm not like that anymore. Amen? I'm, I'm not like that anymore. Uh, should Sal help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Does that mean I'm never to go back and talk to them? That doesn't mean that. It means I'm to witness to them, but I don't play games with them. I don't do it. And I've still yet to convince some people here that that's, they shouldn't do things like that. But they keep right on. They keep right on. And it's just a matter of time before they come to me and say, Oh, Brother Rowan, you know what I want to do? I, I want to grab them and shake them and say, I told you so. That's what I really want to do. I really want to say, I gave you the guidelines. I was preaching that night. You were there, and you didn't heed the message. I'm telling you, if you're not careful, you'll walk long enough, you'll start standing, and if you stand long enough, you'll be seated. Jehovah said, Joseph said, I wish I hadn't have done that. I, w I wish I hadn't done that. So the, here's the prophet asking Jehoshaphat a, a, a wonderful question. Should Sal help the ungodly? and love them and hate the Lord. Jehoshaphat turns. Now here's something about Jehoshaphat. I, that's why I love him. I love him. He's a man of character. Jehoshaphat turns with chastened spirit to his real work in Judah. He said, you're right. Why don't, why don't we, as, and, and children of God sometimes are, are, are some, they're not, not as maybe, but sometimes almost as proud as lost people. Proud of, the, proud of their, 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 their own way. And, they, and they'd, uh, uh, what, what is the old saying? Uh, danged or die. And I hate using that word, but that's, that's what they'd do. Rather than admit the truth, that I'm wrong. I'm, 
Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Jehoshaphat, all sometimes God can chasten you with a word. With a word. If a word doesn't work, you know what he'll do? He'll bring out his hickory switch. You'll have some trouble in your life. You'll have some trouble in your life. If that doesn't work, he's going to bring out the scourge. And if that doesn't work, what's the next step? The coffin. There's a sin and a death out there you don't pray for. All right, now here's just a word. Jehoshaphat turns with chastened spirit to his real work in Judah. What is his real work in Judah? Look at chapter 19, verse 4. Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem and he went out again through the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim and brought them back to the Lord God of their father. Hallelujah, Jehoshaphat. Amen. He went out through the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim and brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. And not only that, the Bible said he set judges in the land throughout all the fenced cities of Judah. Look at verse 6. He said to the judges, Take heed what ye do, for ye judge not man, but, the, but for the Lord. You judge not for man, but for the Lord who is with you in the judgment. Wow. This is the real Jehoshaphat. See, in, in uh, chapter 18, we didn't see the real Jehoshaphat. We saw him in chapter 17. Chapter 18, he kind of got sidetracked. And we see him again in chapter number 9. We see the real Jehoshaphat. So he set Levites in verse number 8 uh, of the Levites and the priests and of the chiefs. He set them up and uh, used it as teachers and preachers and judges and so on. In, uh, in verse number 9, the Bible says this, And he charged them, saying, Thus shall you do, in verse 9 of chapter 19, And he charged them, saying, Thus shall you do in the fear of the Lord faithfully and with a perfect heart. This is how you do it. And what cause soever shall come to you of your brethren that dwell in their cities between blood and blood, between the law and commandments, statutes and judgments, you shall even warn them that they trespass not the Lord. Uh, and so wrath come upon you and upon your brethren. This do ye and you shall not trespass. And on and on. So we find the real Jehoshaphat comes back on the scene. Now here's a good lesson right here. Here's a good lesson. The real Jehoshaphat's back on the scene. But repentance, although he did repent, he, he, he in a godly sense, a Bible sense, Jehoshaphat was sorry for what he did. He saw that. He not only confessed it, but he forsook it. According to Proverbs 28. Now, the lesson is repentance cannot always avert the consequences of the wrong that we do. The results of Jehoshaphat's alliance with Ahab had cost him. The Bible doesn't give us the casualties of the battle with Syria at Ramoth Gilead. Yet Jehoshaphat's one million man army must have been drastically reduced. See, there's consequences of wrong choices. In chapter number 20 and verse number 1, the Bible says this, It came to pass after this also that, that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them other besides the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Now, why did I read that verse? Because this is some of the consequences that Jehoshaphat had to face for making a wrong decision. He had lost a lot of his army. His eastern front was weak. And here's an opportunity now for the countries of the east to come against Israel. And the Bible said it was Moab and it was Ammon and with them other besides the Ammonites. Besides the Ammonites, there was other people that actually joined them. And so they saw their opportunity to attack while Judah was vulnerable. Well, there is no, no million men anymore. There is no strong cities. There is no foreign alliances for support. I can't call anybody else to come help me fight this battle. There, there's not. Look at verse 3 of chapter 20. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout Judah. He faced, he feared, he faced himself, he feared, and he set himself to seek the Lord. And the Bible said he proclaimed a fast. In verse number four, 
Judah gathered themselves together. In verse number 5 of chapter 20, Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord, and he prayed. And this is the prayer. If you'll notice right here, the Bible says in... Um, oh, look at verse... Uh, well, he stood in the congregation, verse 5, verse 6, and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand there is not power. Is there, is there not power and might? So that none is able to withstand thee. Art not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gavest it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever? And they dwell, and they that, and they dwell therein, and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, If when evil cometh upon us as a sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. Where else did we hear that prayed as we were still? Solomon. We studied Solomon and they teach us how to pray. Jehoshaphat is reminding God what Solomon asked and God said he would answer. Look here in verse 10. And now behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir whom thou wouldst not let Israel invade. We came through and you wouldn't let us invade them when they came out of the land of Egypt but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold I say how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession which thou hast given us to inherit. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. I hope you followed that prayer in verse 6. If you didn't, write it down real quickly. In verse number 6, it begins with the thought of the divine sovereignty over all nations. God is sovereign. All nations bow to Him. One day, all nations are going to literally bow to Him. God raises up and puts down. I know we're, we're concerned about a president, and I hope everyone goes out and votes for the right one. Uh, but God raises up and God puts down. Amen. All right, so that's the first part of the prayer. Secondly, he recalls, Je Jehoshaphat recalls the original purpose that Israel should possess the land there in verse 7. Now, he didn't have to remind God of anything. What God did through all of this turmoil was remind him of some things. And then in the third thing, in verse number 8 and 9, the promise of divine protection in verse 8 and 9, they're renewed at the building of the temple when Solomon built the temple. And then he remembers the fourth thing. He remembers, too, that God forbade the invasion of the neighboring people who now endanger Judah. And then he pleads to God in verse number 12 to judge them. And then the last thing he prays right here, we have no might against this great company. We have no might, not some might. We have no might against this great company, verse 12 and 13. You need to notice that. We have no might. And then that phrase, our eyes are upon thee. We have no might. Our eyes are upon thee. This is the keynote of Jehoshaphat's prayer. And what lends its forcefulness is the memory that not so long ago his eyes were on Ahab and Ahab's might and Ahab's strong army and that foreign alliance that he had. The keynote of Jehoshaphat's prayer is reliance upon God. Now, Asa thought that, but reliance upon God and then add this one, alone alone. 
reliance on God alone. After the answer of God through Jehaziel in chapter number 20, now God came upon Jehaziel immediately. Now this is unusual. God gave Jehaziel an answer and Jehaziel gave it to, the, the, to Jehoshaphat in verse number 14, 15, 16, and 17. And if you'll notice in verse 15, the latter part, it says, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. It's not yours. You set this one out. You set this one out, basically. A lesson learned. A lesson learned. Look at verse 20. Now you can read the rest of it there about what they actually did. But in verse number 20, next morning Jehoshaphat addressed Judah with these words. Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. All right. Jehoshaphat passes the lesson. The lesson's learned. You know what the lesson is? The lesson that he gives throughout the whole Bible. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Find out how many times that principle is mentioned in the Bible. You'll find that exact saying in Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6. So we hopefully, prayerfully learn these same valuable lessons Spiritual, spiritual lessons. They're, they're, they're valuable. It'll help you. It'll help you to pray in times of distress and trouble. All right, let's stand our feet. Please, we'll be dismissed.